Thanks for listening to Draw Near with Fred and Kara. Today's episode is one close to our hearts because it's about our friends Francis and Claire, St. Francis and St. Claire of Assisi. And we thought with St. Francis's feast day coming up, it's on October 4th, it would be great to do an episode about them both. But before we get into the topic, speaking of October 4th, mm-hmm. Fred, you want to kind of share? We did share in the last episode, but for those who might not have listened to that one or want a reminder, um, can you tell them what is happening on October 4th? Well, several things are happening on October 4th. Uh, for one thing, uh, the long-awaited arrival of our website, mm-hmm. uh, we go live on October 4th. So we're, we're really excited about that. You'll find the podcast there. You'll find a blog. You'll find uh, lots of information about us, a, a community, a place for you to share your thoughts, to contact us, to send us prayer requests, a place to learn more about us. Uh, if you would like to invite us to speak in your parish, perhaps you can also find that there. Or music. Or music. Yeah, we do music. Yeah. Uh, Maybe love... one day we'll record something. Yes, yeah, we need to. We very much need to. Yeah. So October 4th also, uh, at least the Facebook page is going to go live. Mm-hmm. Uh, really creative handle for us at Fred and Kara. <laughs> so easy to find We're the us. only ones who yes, want that yeah, handle. Yes. So literally if you Google Fred and Kara now, it will come up. Mm-hmm. So draw near a Facebook page uh, will go up on October 4th as well. We yeah. also have... You're going to share about the donations, my favorite part. part. (laughs) This is the part you're looking forward to the most and the part I am looking forward to the least, perhaps, that we are launching a fundraiser on October 4th, beginning October 4th, to help us improve Draw Near, to help us have better equipment and some things we're we're doing here, building a studio space in my house, Mm -hmm. uh, chapel and studio space. I mentioned the last time, St. Therese is literally looking at us We need a Francis and Claire, too. We need a Francis and Claire, yes. But uh, So we do have some expenses that come with doing this work. We did have somebody ask, too, well, what would the money go to? Um, So if that's helpful on on the Patreon page, we will kind of put a wish list of what it would go to and what you would be helping to support. Um, Like... We wanted a camera to potentially be able to do a video podcast and have that available to you to to more invite you into the space and into the show. So stuff like that. But we'd put that up there. But with the fundraiser and we have yet to set the dollar amount, but we will. We'll Mm -hmm. announce that on October 4th. Yeah. If we hit the goal, Kara will shave my beard off live Mm -hmm. on our social media. Yes. Um, I'll probably let your kids do some too. Yeah, I'm sure they will. love it. You know, and I thought she was just going to take the you know, the, the electric trimmer and just kind of buzz me. But apparently she wants to do the full out shave with the razor. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has listened to, I'm a planner. So I am creating like this mapped out. Okay. How many styles can I hit? And so <laughs> I'm just like going to give you mutton chops and a soul mm-hmm. patch, like all of it. So it'll it's be the great. soul patch that worries me the most. Yeah, it'll be really good. It worries me very much. So the thing with this is it's been a very long time since I've not had a beard. <laughs> Last time was skinny, and as I mentioned before, I have a dad body now, as you can plainly see on our website that we'll launch on October 4th. <laughs> um, so I'm a little nervous because I've never seen me mm-hmm. without a beard. Neither has Kara. I have never. Yeah, yes. it'll be fantastic. Yes. So October 4th, look for that coming soon. You did throw out the idea of if we exceed the goal that then I don't have to shave my beard, which I think is bogus. So how about <laughs> if we exceed the goal... Then you have to go around for a week with like a soul patch or a handlebar mustache what? or something. <laughs> then I'm still shaving. I'm still trimming. Yeah, but that'll be fantastic. Yeah, I know you would love that. I would love that. Well, anyway, so yep, that's October 4th. Um, be sure to check out drawnear.me. Um, but today we want to talk about St. Francis and St. Clair. As many of our listeners know, um, they're, they're patrons of our friendship. Mm. Um, and over the past few months, they've really grown even more prominent in our lives. And recently, um, I bought a book. It's called Such is the Power of Love. And it's about St. Francis uh, through the eyes of St. Bonaventure's legends of St. Francis and sermons that he wrote about him. Uh, And I want to share what the back description said that really stood out to us. But before I do, I asked Fred if he would be willing to share a little bit about something that God showed him that led him to Iowa. So, Fred, would you mind sharing that? Yes. Well, when I was discerning where the Lord was going to take me, my desire to serve him, not knowing where that was going to lead, um, I, I really felt in prayer he gave me a picture of fields, and his fields were on fire. And he was, it was like the Lord was saying, 
this is where you were going. Mm -hmm. And I, I told that to Kara one time on one of our many car rides that we have in Iowa, mm -hmm. because ministry in Iowa involves car rides, yeah. inevitably. Long ones. And it seemed to really resonate with her. And, mm -hmm. you know, over the summer, we went to a, a retreat uh, at a Franciscan place and just really in pr prayer i feel like we both had a pretty profound encounter with francis and claire if you mm -hmm. will and fire yeah yeah and <laughs> fire and fire very much yeah and so care read the back of this book and it was like all those pieces just came together yeah. in a lot of ways so i'll let her share what the back of the book said yeah well so i mean we live in iowa there's no shortage of fields but the part that really stood out to me was about fire and there was a point in my life too where and I've shared this with Fred as well, where uh, I just felt really small, like nothing I did was good enough or, or worth anything. Or I was kind of, honestly, I was kind of wallowing, uh, acting a little bit like a child. But I went to God in prayer and I was like, God, I want to set the world on fire, but I feel so small. And uh, he said, even the greatest of wildfires start as only a small ember, which was honestly really transformative. Um, and kind of changed my sad and maybe prideful prayers to God of like, God, I feel so small to really, Lord, let me be small. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the fire, like the call of wanting to set the world on fire and him showing like you can do that through through like starting out small that I think really transformed those thoughts. So fire has always been this theme. Yeah, Kara, as you're saying that, I think, Maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but I think it speaks to what we're talking about because it was is a big part of the life of Francis was do God's will, yeah, be who He created you to be. Now it's actually another saint that said that it was Catherine of Siena, I believe. Be who God created you to be, and, and you, you will set, set the, the world, world on fire. And yeah. I don't know, it's just it's kind of the same principle, same idea there. Mm -hmm. And I know during that time when I first got here coming from a place of a very vibrant Catholic community and not finding that here, I just felt consolation in the Lord just kept saying it's the driest wood that burns the fastest, you know? I love that. Um, so, I, so just draw close to me and I will draw close to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, when I, we were sitting in the car on one of our car rides and I had just gotten this book. And so I started reading the back of the book because I wasn't sure what it was about. And it says, these are Bonaventure, who's a, a seraphic. Am I saying that right? I believe that's the right. Okay. Yeah. Who is a seraphic doctor. And it's his writings about Francis, who he calls a seraphic saint. So seraphic relating to the seraphim choirs. Yeah, the choir an angels. angelic, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, this, might get, this might get boring, but this is the important part. It says that the pseudo Dionysius considered seraphs fire makers. And Hugh of St. Victor interpreted fire as the fire of love because love is superior to knowledge. The seraphim or the fire makers rank as the highest of the choir of angels. And he writes, such is the power of love that it transforms the lover into the beloved. So it was like all of this stuff that really drew us to Francis and Claire and all of this stuff from our past with, with like the desire for fire and setting the world on fire in a good way. And the Holy spirit was like, what does that mean? And how is this going to happen? Reading the back of this book was like, oh, it's going to happen because of love. Right. Like it's the fire of love. Mm -hmm. And it was just this eye opening thing. And I think like that is one of the things that also just propelled man, Francis and Claire, and it right. just got really exciting. It's easy to take for, for granted, but come Holy Spirit and kindle us the fire of your love. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's there. Yeah. So it kind of just gave us this, uh, this gift from Francis and Claire to just kind mm -hmm. of understand better these consolations that we've gotten at different moments in our life, some of which were before we even knew each other. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really was that, you know, this ministry and this call to, to bring the, uh, God to people, it's going to come from love and living out the love of Christ and being a witness of the love of Christ to other people. And so it was really this gift. And, and I think we owe Francis and Claire a lot. So we wanted to bring others to know them and to emulate their love and their holiness. So this is why we're doing this episode. Yeah. And care it's rooted in what we're after. It's rooted in two things. It's rooted in love of God and love of one another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's Francis and Claire too, that, that priority of relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So we've compiled a list 
of five life lessons that we think that you can take from the lives of Francis and Claire. And we want to share a little bit about their lives with you in the midst of these lessons. So we'll just start with one and go to five, if that's cool. Um, Number one is attentiveness to God's call and trust. That's the first life lesson that we can take from Francis and Claire. Attentiveness to God's call and trust. So hearing God's voice to lead them to each other and their, their vocations. And so we kind of mentioned this in our in our previous episode. Um, Fred and I both have been reading books. And his is about St. Francis and mine is about St. Clair. And I finished mine like a month and a half ago. I'm like, yeah, come on, I'm, Fred, I want to read yours. I'm really behind. We're supposed to read. <laughs> And then we're going to discuss our books together. Yeah. <laughs> and she is way ahead of me. I got really into Claire. So I was like yes. done in like a week. Yeah. But um, we were reading these books. And so we're going to kind of share some stories from their life. And I'm sure Fred will have more to share about Francis and, and me, Claire. But if you are wanting to read any more about them, and we can put a link to these. They're books by Brett Thomen. Um, I think that's how you'd say his last name. Thomen, maybe. I'm not sure. T-H-O-M-A-N. And it's just St. Clair of Assisi and St. Francis of Assisi. Those are his books. And they have been fantastic the whole time reading hers. He does caveat uh, Claire's with, you know, he he embellishes a little bit about her life because it's a a book. However, everything, every ending of the chapter, he quotes from the legends of St. Clair, which are historic. And so he's he's embellishing in terms of what might have been said or the order that something might have happened. But it doesn't mean that like that specific uh, event didn't happen because it comes from the legends. So I really like it because it does make her very personal, but also in a in a historic way as much as it, you know, it possibly can. I'd also recommend anybody wanting to learn more to dive dive in deeper before I know we're kind of starting possibly with here's how you learn more (laughs) now here's what we're going to tell you but um you'll want to learn more you'll want to learn more i I hope yeah Yeah. is uh francis a sign of contradiction you can find that online it's father dave pavanka Uh, just google sign of contradiction france saint francis it'll come up powerful movie beautiful movie on saint francis yeah really good Um, Okay, sidetracked a little bit. So lesson one, attentiveness to God's call and trust. And so Fred, do you want to talk a little bit about um, Francis and kind of his, what he did after he heard God's call and um, really that transition from one life to the, to the next life? Yeah. uh, So begin at the beginning, Francis was somebody who always felt a call to greatness on his life and he he thought it was going to be found in worldly things. Uh, he wanted to be a knight because he thought that would give him the respect, the honor he desired. Uh, his father was a wealthy merchant, and had there was a pressure there for him to be great in that sense. Francis was the life of the party. Mm-hmm. He was the instigator. He paid for the fun. You were just reading that. <laughs> yes. And yeah. he came into my office and he goes, uh, he goes, listen to this. And he reads something about Francis saying he was the instigator of evil, yeah. which, which pre-Christ days, was pre-Christ, yeah. I was yeah. like, Fred, that was totally you. Right. <laughs> so yeah. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah. But what, what's interesting about Francis, just like with many of the saints is, is God takes those those qualities they had in their life before Christ and reverses them and Mm -hmm. uses those gifts for good. And you see that with Francis as he tries to become a a, a knight. He fails. He falls short. He's actually taken prisoner, spends time in prison, goes back home. His father buys him new armor, goes back out again. And the Lord appears to him one night in a dream and tells him to go back to Assisi. And there he will find everything he's looking for. And then that was a very dark and difficult time for Francis because, you know, he felt like everything was being stripped away from him. He wasn't finding the greatness he was he was seeking. And then one day he encountered a leper on the road. Um, leprosy, in those days especially, that was you, you avoided those people. Mm-hmm. But he was going through a, a powerful experience of, of conversion. And he actually embraced the leper. And it... it it changed his heart. It made him, it, it stirred in him a desire to do God's will and God's will alone. That's kind of where it began with Francis. Yeah. And so much so that he went, 
back to Assisi and in front of his bishop and in front of his family, he renounced all that he was entitled to, um, all of his wealth, all of his, you know, the stature of his title and he stripped naked in front of (laughs) in front of his bishop and his family members talk about trust (laughs) yeah and it really was his father was quite upset with him Mm -hmm. you know francis had heard the call from the lord in prayer to go and rebuild the church go rebuild my church uh the lord said to him and we'll talk about this more later i'm sure but you know taking it a little more literally he set out to do that Mm -hmm. and his intentions were good, but he used some of his father's um, materials to sell and acquire the funds he needed to do it. His father became quite angry with him, understandably so, I feel like, and confronted him with the bishop present. And Francis really kind of let everything go. He said, I renounce all of this. He stripped naked. It's a beautiful story, really, because what you find there. Although Francis was cutting himself off from worldly riches, the bishop actually took off his his cloak mm-hmm. and covered yeah. him and embraced him and took him in. So there's this pattern in Francis' life where you see you see a conflict, you see a separation, but then you see an incredible embrace where God redeems everything in Francis' life, all the struggles. Although there still may be suffering, he redeems every part of his life and, and something greater results from it. Yeah. And I would say in the context of Claire, just her attentiveness to God's call, it's very obvious throughout her life that she felt called to something more because her she also is coming from a very wealthy family. And, you know, you the way that you grew in wealth, especially they had just come back from, you know, an attack on, on Assisi and they were coming back and, you know, their, their home had been broken into and they were wanting to secure their position. And so... They wanted to marry off Claire for the sake of gaining more wealth, gaining more land, whatever it might have been. And Claire very much did not want to get married. Um, She knew that her heart was for something else and for someone else, and that was for God. And so um, after almost a year of meeting with Francis in secret and listening to him teach, and feeling drawn to the way he spoke about scripture and life, she decided that she wanted to join him as um, a woman because his his company was really just men, but she wanted to be the first woman, a woman. And so she ran away in the middle of the night because she knew her family was not going to let her go. And so she ran away. She had one of her one of her family members accompany her and um, to the edge of town, and then she went with Francis and his brothers, and she left to go and join them. And during this time, um, I think it was specifically her uncle. There's kind of speculation if her dad was still alive, Um, but her uncle was very, very angry that she had left. And so he went to go and get her and he was threatening, like, I'll drag you out by your hair. And so there's this illustration in, in the book I was talking about where Francis had actually shaved her head and that was the sign of her vows and then she put the veil on and we'll get to that in a second too because I think there's some you know penance within Care, there can too. Can I shave your head no, for never. a fundraiser? No <laughs> no no never but Francis had shaved her head so in this time when her uncle was like I'll drag you out by your hair she just pulls off her veil and she's bald <laughs> so just like her her understanding of what God is calling her to to the point of letting everything else go, relinquishing, you know, her family's wealth and comfort and going to serve God because that's what she felt called to. Um, I would say that that is such a a strong example of Mm. the attentiveness to our call that God gives us. And then another thing that we said within this same lesson, um, point one, is attentiveness to God's call, but also trust in the Lord. And so um, when I thought of this for specifically um, St. Francis, it kind of came back that the way that Francis was living, because it was so different from what was going on at this time, uh, he was being called a heretic. And so... Or a madman. Yeah, or a madman, just because it was so... Like, why would you want to relinquish worldly comfort and wealth? And so he set off to go to Rome and to get approval by the Pope. 
And kind of going back to what Fred said, what, that he had heard this call to rebuild my church. When he went and talked to the Pope, he saw a man holding up, was it St. John Lateran? Yes, which is the main church. Yeah, in, so, yep, yeah. in Rome. And he saw a man, uh, St. John Lateran was falling, and he saw a, a small man just holding it up. And that man was Francis. And so he approved his order. But just that trust in the Lord, when you have all of these people who are coming against you in what you are doing, mm -hmm. and just to trust that, you know, God's got this, you know, because to be called a heretic in that, like, that's a huge problem for what he's trying to do in the movement right. he's wanting to make in the church. Yeah, I love Bonaventure puts these, Bonaventure is one of the first biographers of St. Francis. He himself was a Franciscan. Mm -hmm. He puts these words in Francis' mouth. So we have, we can trust that Francis said this. He said, all of my treasure and all of my hope are in my heavenly father. And in that, you kind of see that, that dedication, that all my trust and hope is in him. He's the, he's where I put my trust and hope. So everything he did before his life, you know, he was very saddened by uh, the things he did before Christ. And yet by the power of the Holy Spirit, his desires were transformed into a radical trust. And I would say that um, Claire definitely has the same trust. I think there are many moments in her life where you could point to for that trust. But one that stood out to me was, um, so when Claire was the first woman to follow Francis, but many women started following her and some of those were her family members. So her mom actually came and joined the order and her sisters came and joined the order. But the first one after Claire was her sister, Catherine. And just like, you know, her family was really mad when Claire left, they came after Catherine and they came to take her and they ended up getting her out and they were taking her and dragging her back to her home. And Claire went into the chapel and she prayed for her sister that her body would become too heavy to lift. And, and the men who were moving her were unable to move her body. And Claire, actually, she was not there. She was in the chapel when this was all happening, but she could see it. She saw what was happening. And she's actually the, the patroness of television for kind of this reason. Like she could see what was actually going on. And there was one time where she was too sick to go to Christmas mass and she could see mass on the wall. Mm-hmm. So this is why she's the patroness of television, but she could see all of this happening. So she was praying that her sister Catherine's body would be too heavy to move. And then the men who were taking her were unable to move it. And so they were so angry that they started beating her. And so she continued to pray that they would be unable to move their limbs against her. And then they couldn't, they, they couldn't move their limbs against her. And so just like this trust in God that I, it, it makes me think of the scripture passage. Like if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Mm -hmm. She had such faith and such trust that God would answer her request to protect her sister yeah. that it happened. Whatsoever you pray, when you pray, believe you receive and you shall. That's yeah. incredible faith. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely beautiful. And so Catherine did end up coming and, and they protected her and they changed her name to Agnes. But she did come in and join and... I think that trust that Catherine had or that Claire had and the prayers that she offered for her sister were a big part of that. So life lesson number one from Francis and Claire is attentiveness to God's call and trust. Life lesson number two is holiness in your present state in life. And Fred and I have a lot of opinions about this. Yes, you're going to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, this is this particular topic in several upcoming yeah. episodes. Yeah, so this is not a Fred and Kara opinion episode. Um, so we just are going to pull from the life of Francis Sinclair. But we do have an upcoming episode on it that we're excited for. Um, but I think Francis, and we've mentioned his call, he heard the cross of San Damiano. He saw this cross in the church of San Damiano. And Christ on the cross spoke to him and he said, rebuild my church. And Fred, I think, uh, I think you talk about this very well. So how did that call lead to Francis living out holiness in his present state in life? I think one thing that a lot of, uh, the early writers speak about is how as Francis was rebuilding the church, God was rebuilding St. Francis. Yeah. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. We touched on this. Francis wasn't not ready to rebuild the universal church, which is really what God was talking about. You alluded to it in the vision of the Pope, ha the, the Pope had, mm -hmm. but 
he was ready to pick up a brick. Right. He was ready to begin that process. So in that, starting where he was, starting small as it was, you mentioned feeling small earlier. Mm -hmm. God was rebuilding Francis on the inside. That renewal was taking place. So Francis was being faithful to the call God had in his life, but it was in the moment, which yeah. was picking up a brick. It was sweeping. It mm -hmm. was going into the town and saying, I want to rebuild the church. W will you help me? Mm -hmm. Which he did. You know, he didn't have the resources to build. He built, rebuilt a lot of churches, actually. And he didn't have the resources, but he had a radical faith and trust in God that God had called me to do this, this big thing. And yet I have to be faithful in the small things. That, that's the thing that stands out to me with St. Francis. And yeah. maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because we're going to talk about this a lot in future episodes here. But St. Francis didn't sit around and say, God's called me to do this great thing. Someday I mm -hmm. will do that great thing. Right. You know, he was faithful to the moment. Right. Holiness in the moment. Greatness in the moment. What did that look like? For Francis at that time, it looked like picking up a brick right. and praying and being faithful to God in the moment. I've heard some people say, like, they interpret what he did as a response to God's words, rebuild my church, as Francis misunderstood what God meant because he didn't go rebuild the church. He just started rebuilding San Damiano. But I heard another interpretation that I like better, and it's that Francis understood exactly what God meant, that it was about the universal church. But he realized, just like what Fred said, he realized that he was not interiorly ready to go rebuild the universal church. And so instead, he was just faithful where he was at. And that meant picking up a brick, like what you said. Mm -hmm. So I like that interpretation much better because I think we often can sometimes find ourselves like what you said, like, I know I'm called to this, but not yet. I was actually just thinking about that. Like I've, I've been kind of struggling with, you know, falling back into the habit of binge watching. Like, are you still watching? Yes, I'm still watching. It just keeps running. And I don't like that because I feel very empty at the end of my night if I'm just like sitting there binge watching. And I had this like question in my mind. Well, Kara, if you feel empty and you feel far away from me, then what do you need to do? And I know the answer. It's like, okay, stop binge watching. But in my head, right. I'm like, yeah, but I just started a new series and like, I'm not done yet. And so I'm like, I'll stop watching in a month, you know? So it's like, I know what I'm called to, right? but I don't want to do it yet. Yeah. But what Francis did when he says, I know what I'm called to, I am going to do it, but this is where I need to start. So starting in those little steps and realizing what, God, what is God calling me to and, and having an act of your will to do those necessary steps to get there. Yeah. And that is the story of St. Francis and obviously Claire as well, is this radical abandonment to God and his will. You see that a lot with Francis. Mm -hmm. All he really wants to do is the will of the Father. And he's very attentive to the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit in that work, such that Francis' last words on his deathbed could be, I have done what is mine to do. Now may Christ teach you what is yours. Mm -hmm. I think there's a valuable lesson in that. Yeah. And in terms of Claire, I think we already talked a little bit about this, but just her being able to show her holiness and she's not doing this to show someone, but people have said that just her example of holiness and her example of love to others really drove them deeper into their own faith. She showed that with her family so much so that her all of her sisters and her mother joined the order with her because of her example of love and her example of holiness. And within her order, she showed love and she showed humility. You know, she would teach her order about God's words in scripture and the many things that she learned from from Francis and from prayer, her own personal prayer. Um, and also, you know, just her, her holiness to Christ, like she was willing to give up sleep often. She very rarely slept according to her, her sisters because she wanted to go sit in the chapel and pray. And so just that level of, I really think like returning back to, you know, I have to stop watching Netflix. It really is just this, this act of your will recognizing this is what I need to do and saying, okay, I'm going to do it. And that's what she did. She's like, I need to spend time with God. And so she got up out of her bed, gave up sleep, and went and spent time with God. 
And, and I think that's a beautiful example of holiness. I know the next point is probably Fred's favorite because he's, he's getting excited and mine because I really like scripture. So the third point and lesson that we can learn from Francis and Claire is their zeal to live out God's words. Um, Francis's rule of life for his order was just scripture passages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that was his rule of life. Yeah. So they had this zeal and attentiveness to live out the word of God. Um, the rich young man was one of his mm-hmm. favorite passages where he says, where Jesus says to the rich young man, go sell all your things and come after me and mm-hmm. come follow me. And so this was very much uh, a part of his way of life was embracing poverty. And I know, um, Fred, you're, you can talk probably better a little bit about poverty, but it wasn't just like, I'm going to go be poor and not live in my family's wealth. There was more to that. Go and sell all your things and come after me. There's two parts there. Go sell all your things. But what is the come after me part? And that's poverty. Yeah. And Prince's idea of poverty isn't, like you said, it's not just rooted in be broke. Right. Have no no wealth or anything. It's, it's much deeper than that. It's a disposition of the heart. Um, it's, it's something bigger, something more important. Funny thing is, the day we're recording this, the scripture readings mm-hmm. for the day, the mass readings, actually are related. It's the self-emptying of God, the kenosis, uh, where uh, God humbled himself and became man. That is where Francis' idea of poverty is rooted. His embrace of poverty is, is rooted in that desire to imitate that self-emptying of God himself. For Francis, it was emptying himself of the things of the world in order to more fully embrace God. So Kara, if you were, we did the come follow me episode, it's one of the first episodes we did. And you made this beautiful point in there that I had never thought of. And I've given that come follow me talk many, many times mm-hmm. for years. And I never made this connection, but it's a very Francis, Francis and Claire sort of point. You said it's hard for somebody to pick up their cross if they're holding onto their net. And if you don't know what I mean by that, I encourage you to go back and listen to that come follow me episode because it's a perfect compliment to a conversation about Francis. That's what Francis is getting at. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a flight from the world. He wasn't saying the world is bad. Actually, Francis is very much the opposite of that Mm -hmm. because God is love. God create the loving God created all that there is. And so that creation reflects the love of God. So he didn't see that. In fact, even with his, religious life. It was entirely new, the idea that the world would be their cloister. So it wasn't necessarily a rejecting everything of the world. In fact, sometimes there's stories of folks that would want to have dinner with him and he stayed in their house. Mm -hmm. There's also many stories where he used a rock as a pillow. (laughs) So he knew how to embrace both when it was right to do so. Right. But for Francis, poverty is is detachment from everything that interfered with God's ability to reach him, for God's ability to speak to him. So your your binge watching yeah. example, yeah. like if God is trying to speak to us, po- a poverty for Francis would be learning to let go of that binge watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I don't need to watch The Office every episode for the 24th time. I don't know if it's been that long, <laughs> Kara. I know some episodes, I've probably seen that many times. Yeah, That's poverty for Francis. It's about attitude. It's about inner disposition. It's about values. It's the soul that is free of self and free from selfishness and, and willing to fully surrender to the will of God. That's poverty for Francis. Yeah, I like that. And one of, one of his other scripture passages for his rule of life goes with that too, which this is by far my favorite scripture passage, uh, Matthew 16. It's where he says, if you wish to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. And that is poverty. That's the spirit of poverty, being able to recognize what is keeping me from total abandonment to God and his own will and being able to say, I deny myself this, because that's what Jesus says, deny yourself. And when we're talking about come follow me, you can't take up the cross if you're carrying your net. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up the cross. So we have to be able to have that poverty of spirit, like what Matthew's gospel talks about. Luke's gospel just says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those 
who are poor. But Matthew's gospel says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So being able to totally abandon ourselves to those things that we are clinging to of this world, because we are not of this world. We are made for God and we are made for heaven. And so kind of going along with um, that passage of deny yourself within this point three, lesson three uh, for Francis Sinclair, zeal to live out God's word is this deny yourself in Matthew 16, because they would willingly Mm -hmm. enter into suffering and points of repentance willingly. Like even my example of Francis shaved Claire's head. Okay. Well, they would wear wool clothing. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how itchy and crazy irritating (laughs) that would be to wear wool clothing and you have like growing hair coming back? That would be terrible. Yeah. I'm still trying to picture, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. Fran, um, Claire yeah. slept on a wood pillow. Wood pillow. She she willingly gave up her bed, slept on the floor, and her pillow was a wood log. Nice. <laughs> I'm just picturing, and this was Kara's point, so I'm not picking on her. Yeah. But we were talking about this earlier because we had to travel a lot for our work. Yeah. She always has her pillow with <laughs> her pillow. that she always brings, and it's this big, comfy-looking pillow. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't go anywhere without my <laughs> pillow where I can't sleep. I'm like, man, then, I need to become more like Claire. She's just like, give me that log. I'm yeah, good. Give me that log. That's good enough. Is there a mushroom growing up? Oh, it's perfectly fine. You know? <laughs> That'll be breakfast. <laughs> breakfast, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but they willingly enter into repentance because they want to practice this habit and this disposition of being able to deny themselves mm-hmm. and truly living in poverty, not without resources per se, but without this attachment to the world because they want their hearts to be for God. Right. And things. Yeah. And it was such that, like you mentioned penance, it's not for, for Francis, for Claire, penance isn't, it's not something that begins and ends. We, we tend to think of penance that way. I feel like what's your penance after mm-hmm. confession Yeah, to our fathers and right. a Hail Mary right. or, you know, Lent, I give up soda pop, Yeah, you know, or Coke for the listeners in Georgia. Whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, what's a soda pop? We're yeah. in Iowa. Come yeah. on, Fred. Well, I thought I would use both words. <laughs> okay. Just to cover all the bases. <laughs> a soda <So> pop. <laughs> Coke is for the people in Georgia. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, you know, it's 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 more than that. For for Francis and Claire, it's it's a state of the heart. It's a way to be daily. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty it's, sure it's in their rule of life. You're you're entering into a life of penance. Yeah. And Francis actually identifies five elements of penance, if you will. It's the love of God, mm. which we've talked about a lot. It's the love of neighbor. It's a hatred of sin. It's a hatred of sin. It's reception of the sacraments. And it's producing fruits worthy of that repentance. It's those five areas. That's what penance looks like for Francis. But what I think is also unique with Francis, again, going back to the relationship point, is he ties it into relationship. Is rooted in relationship. For Francis and Claire... Their piety is rooted in familial relationship. That Again, that's really what's unique about Francis and Claire and the religious movement that they started. Mm-hmm. They live in relationship with one another. I like this approach to life. Um, I don't know why, but suffering is probably one of my favorite things to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, just I think it was St. Faustina. Um, She wrote, if we knew the joys and the fruits of suffering in this life, that's all we would desire would Mm -hmm. be to suffer because we have this beautiful teaching of the Catholic Church on redemptive suffering. And the more we have, the more we are able to offer that up. So imagine like they are willingly entering into suffering and, you know, things to practice penance how much joy must they have had in their life and in their heart to be able to take that and offer it back to God yes. and up for other people. And this is scripture, Colossians one twenty four. we fulfill what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. We offer up our sufferings and that suffering serves a purpose. We have did episode on several episodes, actually. It was actually our most listened to episode mm-hmm. uh, on people YouTube. People must still need is. to hear yeah. about suffering. <laughs> uh, willingness to suffer is what it was called. Mm-hmm. But the idea that suffering does serve a purpose I think you can see this with Francis and Claire as well. It's been 800 years. Mm -hmm. Kara, they were both born 800 years before us, literally. Yeah. Um, And here they are still rebuilding the church. No doubt that is because of the fruit of their own suffering that they offered it up. Mm -hmm. You know, that grace continues to work 
continues to echo throughout the ages. What did you say that uh, from the time of Francis's conversion to the time of his death was only what, like 19 years? It was so he died at 44. Uh-huh. His conversion was at 25. Yeah. Yeah. So God made a quick work of oh, that. Yeah, and absolutely. we're still 800 years mm. living out his life. And he's and, still rebuilding the church. And still re- rebuilding the church. Yeah, absolutely. So um, point three was zeal to live out God's word. So in order to emulate that and grow in that ability in our own life, the first step would be go get yourself a Bible or pull your Bible out from your cabinet um, and make sure that you are spending time with scripture every single day, Mm. because that's how we become familiar with the voice of God. And that's how we are able to know how he calls us to live and to live that out in our own life. Amen. So point four, the, the lesson that we can learn from Francis and Claire is evangelization. Um, having the heart of Christ to those who are interested. And I love this. Uh, I think I made this point in the car with you the other day that I, I just love Francis's approach to people mm-hmm. because after he, you know, stripped naked and renounced everything, I mean, people are going to hear about that. That's a, a <laughs> that's probably a hard one to overcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are going to know about you. Um, but people would just show up in front of him at San Damiano or wherever he was and say, I've heard about you and I want to join you. And he would just say, okay. You know, he didn't, he didn't care about what's your educational background. He just simply welcomed them as brothers. He didn't care about, you know, how long have you known Jesus? Yeah. He's yeah. just like, okay, you know, come, you're welcome. Yeah. In fact, Francis actually had a, cur- a concern that too much education could squelch or hinder Mm -hmm. the prayer life it had to be kept in balance the prayer life had to be the priority Mm -hmm. so it's kind of neat that yeah everybody was welcome some of his first followers his first follower that i'm aware of uh, was a very wealthy man and then one of his next followers giles of assisi was his name was a peasant Mm -hmm. and they all lived together in community as one yeah and were radically committed to this preaching the gospel and going into from town to town and proclaiming the gospel message, proclaiming God's love for everyone around them. That was something that really resonated with Francis that he saw himself as the chief of sinners. And yet he was so overwhelmed by how much God loved him Mm -hmm. despite that. Mm -hmm. And it was, he couldn't help but proclaim that love such that if Francis heard somebody speaking ill of a priest or a bishop, he would simply respond with, through those blessed hands, I receive Jesus. That was the kind of love he had for Christ. That was the kind of love he wanted to share with others. How often do we encounter just complaints about our priests and bishops in, in our life or in work for the church or right. just being around the church? It's incredibly frequent. Yeah. Can you imagine? Responding if, that yeah, way. Yeah, responding that way. That's so... I think that would have such a powerful impact. And, and I'll be honest, when I, when I read the words of Francis, because I, I think this is the heart of an evangelist, and I think this is why I'm sharing this. When I read those words of Francis, I was convicted. Mm-hmm. Like when I hear people complaining about this bishop or that bishop or, you know, this priest and that priest, do I respond that way? Right. Through their blessed hands, I receive Jesus. Mm-hmm. That is a heart that loves the Lord. That is a heart that wants to share that love with others. That is a call to holiness. Yeah. That is a good a good way to approach others rather than just being negative, but putting the focus in the right place, God's love. He also did that when, whenever he'd enter a church, mm-hmm. no matter the condition of the church, no matter what the church looked like. Now, Francis did want churches to be beautiful because reverence is owed, and he's a very reverent person out of his love for the Lord, but... No matter what the church looked like whenever he walked in the door, he would say, We adore you, Lord Jesus Christ, and all your churches throughout the world. And we bless you, for through your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Notice again two things. He's acknowledging the presence of the Lord in every church. Mm -hmm. But he's also remembering the good good news, the gospel message of the cross, of what God's love has done. So there's always that evangelistic 
focus on everything Francis does, everything he says. And I think it's a beautiful thing. He and, is captivated by the love of God. And he's not giving in to the temptation to complain. And I, and I never knew that prayer came from him. Mm -hmm. uh, we adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, for by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I never knew that came from Francis. But to think of that now, like in those moments of wanting to complain, potentially about liturgy or about a priest, mm -hmm. to just pause and, like you said, recognizes the presence of God in the mm -hmm. tabernacle in the church or in the the ministry of the priesthood being right. able to bring us Christ or even where two or three are gathered yeah that is one of the most beautiful things about Francis as well because his sense of evangelization his sense of mission was such that he recognized Christ present in every person mm -hmm. and was compelled to love them all the more because of it and it goes back to what I said earlier about uh, God created out of love, therefore every all of creation reflects the love of God, but especially the human person. Mm -hmm. So I just that's so beautiful to me that that compelled him mm -hmm. to evangelize. I just see his example too of evangelization and especially of just welcoming people in. Like if we lived out the mission of the church in that way, mm -hmm. like I don't care about your educational background, I don't care about your experience, and we we pause and get to know the person's heart. What are your desires to grow closer to Christ, to bring others closer to Christ or something different and to fulfill your own will as opposed to God's own will. And you were saying that he didn't care about education. It reminds me, I think it was Benedict the 15th, I think, um, who was talking about St. Therese, who's right here in the corner staring mm -hmm. at us. Um, and was talking about her and said, though she was not learned, she had the quickest and surest way to heaven. And yeah. so I, and I think there is just this like humility in the heart, regardless of your education, mm -hmm. there should be this humility in the heart to just grow closer to Christ. And I think Francis saw that in every person that he met. It was, wasn't about your job description, your qualifications, your resume. It was about your heart and your desire for Christ. Right. Kira, I think we see that in his encounter with the leper. Yeah. St. Francis didn't want anything to do with lepers. Nobody really did in, the, in those times. But he was, he found them particularly repugnant. Now, that's his word. They words. lived outside of Assisi. Yeah. They were not allowed in the city. Yeah. And he would go out of his way to avoid them. But in that embrace of the leper, he really overcome all those obstacles, those walls he built mm -hmm. in seeing Christ in the other. I don't know. I think that 800 years later, that rings out, especially today in our very divided world. Who were the lepers in our life yeah. that we don't want anything to do with? that think differently than us that may look differently than us. And yet Francis says, embrace them, mm -hmm. love them and conversion and being closer with Christ is on the other end of that. And I think that's a beautiful thing. That's what evangelization looks like. Yeah. And point number five, the final lesson that we can learn from Francis and Claire, obviously <laughs> is friendship. Mm -hmm. we like we like that one yes yeah um i just, think we've kind of touched on this throughout we, the yeah, whole thing yeah, yeah. we've yeah. touched on this throughout the whole thing and in previous episodes um just their care for one another um the story of francis's death really got me in the book about saint Clair. i cried during this part because i'm reading it from the the point of saint Clair, and she's not with francis at the time of his death um he's down the hill at the port um church so she is sleeping and she wakes up in the middle of the night because she feels like Francis is gone and she goes uh, outside and she looks down the hill and it says that she just feels this light leaving and she can see this light leaving and I just started crying because her desire to want to be there with her friend at this time is so strong in her heart and I think it shows the love that she truly had for Francis who had made such an impact in her life and Francis, uh, before he passed away, he said, take my body to the sisters. And so he cared so much for Claire and for those women who cared for him that he wanted to be there after. And they wanted to, you know, let them see him and be mm -hmm. with him. And, and so they brought Francis to Claire and it says that, you know, she cried over him and she kissed his hands. And there's just this really profound love mm -hmm. that they have for each other that I think is so beautiful and, uh, and so strong. And I, I think it's something that we can emulate. Um, and we talk a lot more about this in our friendship episode as well, but 
uh, I would say that that is a life lesson that we can take from them is just the way that they care for one another, Mm -hmm. not just each other, but also, you know, Francis to his brothers and and Claire to her sisters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So just to recap really quick, um, we were talking about Francis and Claire this whole time, and we have five life lessons from them. So lesson one, attentiveness to God's call and trust. Lesson two, holiness in your present state in life. Three, zeal to live out God's word. Four, evangelization with the heart of Christ. And five is friendship. And we are uh, really happy to just get to sit here and talk about Francis and Claire because I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there about Francis. Yes. Um, yeah. He's like, not just a guy that likes animals. No, he's not just yeah. a hippie who likes animals. Yeah. And we do the, you know, the pet blessing because why? Because of St. Francis. I don't know. Um, he's not. There's another misconception from Franciscan friars that they talked about. He's not this jovial, relatable guy who just drinks beer. Right. Um, he he is this sacrificial, holy man who gave his life and gave up everything to follow the will of God and brought people to a new place in their life and in this time in history that he lived Mm. to be able to relinquish everything and just give themselves to God. And Claire was one of the the first fruits of that. Yeah. He's a really complex person in some ways, but also very simple. Simple in the fact that everything was rooted in how much he loved the Lord. Mm -hmm. But complex in that, on one hand, yes, he loves animals. Yes, he's a poet. Yes, he talks a lot about love. And nature. And nature. But he's also a pretty hardcore tough guy. Yeah. You know, sleeping on a rock. Right. His pillow is right. a rock. Undergoing the stigmata. The stigmata. Yeah. You know, he had a lot of debilitating health problems and yet traveled all over the world. He he was also very compassionate and very loving and caring um, and all those things. So mm-hmm. simple And the fact that everything was about his love of God and doing his will, but complex in that you can't paint him a character of him. Right. It doesn't work. Yeah. So hopefully this episode has has been able to shed some light on um, Francis and and Claire and give us something to think about. And I really want to encourage you to continue reading about them and learning about them. Uh, Fred has this joke where he'll, he'll send me like, where's Claire in this church? And then he'll do like, oh, not complaining about a church or anything. Mm. But he'll be like, he'll, he'll send me hashtag helps for Claire because right, he just yeah. wants like mm. more people to to have right. devotion to her and to love mm. her too. So hopefully this episode has helped you to know a little bit more about Francis and Claire and also instill in you this desire to continue to learn more and begin to emulate their holiness.